Wednesday. We're going to go ahead and get started. And our first topic is single use plastics and a proposed county ordinance. The County of Monterey is joining other local communities restricting or planning to restrict the use of single use plastics. So there are a lot of questions. What's the timeline for the change? Who does it affect? And how will food businesses in unincorporated Monterey County make this change? We're very pleased to have Brian Azevedo from our County of Monterey Health Department Environmental Health Bureau to explain the proposed ordinance and how businesses can comply. Hi, Brian. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. So, Thanks for joining us. Yes. So um, this this uh, this ordinance is is in line with state regulations um, AB twelve seventy six, which uh, requires the dispensing of single use plastics, condiments, and um, utensils. Um, to be given to the consumer when asked and not given automatically. That's the intention of the state regulation. And we are, uh, <clears throat> we modeled after it. So it's nothing different than uh, what the state currently requires um, across all of California. Thank you, Brian. So how so we're we're going to be in line with with the state, but how will we be rolling this out and letting businesses yeah. know and comply? Sure. So we um we've actually had since uh, 2022, we've had um, it on our our web page, uh, a notification and a link to the requirements of uh, AB 1276. And so um, a lot of the food facilities are uh, aware and currently practicing um, that uh, as inspectors go out and conduct inspections of the food facilities, they're also, you know, educating them while th they're, they're out there doing the inspection um, to, uh, to go over the, one of the questions in the comment is regarding the direction of the board with regards to mobile food facilities. We are putting together uh, information in both English and Spanish, and we'll be reaching out to those mobile food facilities that have permits with uh, Monterey County Environmental Health and the temporary food facilities that also have health permits with uh, Monterey County Environmental Health and letting them know of, uh, of this change. So now we're we're seeing how it will affect businesses, but for the consumer, what should the consumer know about this ordinance? You know about whether they should ask for items, whether they sh what should they expect these food vendors to be giving them, and what should they know? Yeah, so uh, a lot, most of the food vendors are already practicing this. You know, they'll they'll ask the customer, you know, um, how many, you know packets of, of ketchup or sauce would you like um, th that sort of question so that way you know they're given what what the, the customer is, is asking versus to uh, the where the practice before was automatically giving um, uh, unknown undispensed amount um, automatically so that's that's the intention of the law is to just provide the consumer, what the consumer is uh, is asking for, and yeah, and also, the... and also, um, not no longer having items bulk packaged, you know, um, and when I when I say items bulk packaged, um, some of the utensils would be packaged along with a napkin and maybe a salt and pepper packet, a stir straw. Um, this this regulation um, uh, does not allow for that. So everything should be uh, dispensed uh, individually and um, and given, you know, when when asked for by the customer. And so, and then one more question for me before we get to some of the questions in chat. The end result of this, the the end goal is to reduce 
uh, waste, correct? And also right. what's going into our landfill. Because, I mean, a lot of communities are putting these together because we're really impacted in our landfills. That's correct. And we only have two landfills in Monterey County that are uh, currently in operation. And so we want to, uh, you know, prolong the life of those landfills because, um, you know, no one wants a new landfill uh, uh, created, um, you know, but it's really the responsibility of the consumers to, you know, to ask for the items that, you know, they intend to use and, and consume. And, um, you know, hopefully this, this impacts, um, waste generated, um, and, and minimizes that, right. Um, for just, um, consuming the items that we, we, you know, we need for our meals, right. Or sauces or, or a utensil if needed, um, versus, uh, grabbing a handful and, um, and discarding a bunch of items that, um, we don't intend to use or consume. And then a, a question in the chat, single, so single use plastics can be distributed to consumers if they request them. It's not a ban on them in entirety and in their right. entirety. Yes, right. It's, um, it's, it's just uh, limiting the amount that's being provided to the amount that is requested by the consumer, right? Um, and so, you know, consumers should do their due diligence and, and only, you know, ask for items they intend to, to consume and use um, with their meal. Um, yeah. And does this also affect the container? If, if you're going to a restaurant and doing takeout or you're going to a mobile food vendor, does this affect the container that the, you're going to be receiving your food in? No, this won't, this won't uh, affect that. This won't affect that. Yeah, if you're if you're having a, a, a to go container, you know, let's say you're going through a, a drive through or a, um, or you order your food through a third party uh, provider, um, it won't it won't change change that. It will change um, and bulk dispensing will be encouraged uh, for dining areas should be should be in place so if if the food facility has dine-in option um, where the consumer can sit down and consume uh, it is encouraged that they have and required that they have bulk dispensing of uh, condiments for the consumer versus um, you know uh, a unlimited amount of uh, sauce packets or you know condiment packets and then another question um when will this take a, i'm assuming the question is when will this take effect and this is for is this uh for all of monterey county or unincorporated monterey county so um this will be uh this will take effect you know when the board of supervisors uh um, approves and passes this ordinance um it will uh, it will take effect in in Monterey County um, uh, in the in the unincorporated portion because it's county code. And then for people who may not know how many food uh, vendors or uh, restaurants might be affected by this, I think the number is in the six hundred. So there there really are quite a lot of food vendors in unincorporated Monterey County. Well, that that's 600 uh, number includes also the mobile and the temporary food facilities, right? So a temporary food facility and a mobile vendor, um, you know, they uh, they may work in a, an event in the unincorporated area, but they may also um, work an event, you know, in an incorporated area, correct? So um, they're not they're not limited to um, to the area as, as a fixed food facility is. Any other questions for Brian? Um, and uh, potential fines. What, 
I, I know that there was some talk about, you know, rolling it out so that uh, giving the food operators an opportunity to comply. But what are fines for this yeah. if they do not comply? Yeah. So we, um, you know, along with our, our routine uh, inspections or complaint inspections, we do have uh, fees for uh, reinspection. But the intention of, of this is to um, have the business uh, comply um, if they are found in violation, they will it will be noted on their inspection report, and there will be a follow up date given for that compliance and a follow up inspection. Right? Um, if there's continued non compliance, just like with any other violation of of the the California Retail Food Code and our um, our 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 county codes, if if there's continued non-compliance and there's methods to um, to bring the facility into compliance, and we always try to educate first um, and foremost, um, and and help these facilities, um, you know, be in compliance and and adhere to the the regulations that are imposed on them. The, the, and the goal, the goal ultimately is compliance, not necessarily fines. Uh, right. Any other questions? Any other questions for Brian? Um, just you know, I asked you about food containers. People may not recall, but there is a polystyrene uh, ordinance in the county, and that kind of handles the 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 container uh, issue. Where yeah. so right now, what is it? So if people want to be a good consumer when they get their food and it's in a container, what type of container should it be in? Um, it's the there's no there's no requirement uh, on the food facilities to to you know um, provide a certain type of container. They could provide plastic or paper. It's encouraged, obviously, um, you know as as with another regulation, 1383, which we've already passed, um, takes enforcement for that takes in effect next year. Um, it's it's encouraged that you know food facilities you know purchase you know packaging that is um, either uh, compostable or or um, or reusable, um, but it's not required. It's encouraged, but not required at this time. Thank you. Any other last questions for Brian before we let him go? Seeing none, thank you, Brian, very much for being here today and explaining. And then we'll look for the board to take up the matter in two weeks, correct? Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next topic. Uh, with the help of some very significant grant funding, plans are now being put in motion to install three level three EV chargers at libraries in Castroville, San Lucas, and Greenfield by next summer. The project expands access to EV chargers in the county's rural areas, plus it puts chargers in those rural areas as the county looks to expand or electrify its fleet. So we're going to talk about the project, and we're very pleased to have Cora Pantarot, who is with our, the County of Monterey Sustainability Program, Hillary Thayer, our uh, library director, and Sarah King, who is with FreeWire Tech, which are makers of ultra-fast electric vehicle chargers. Thank you, ladies, very much for being here to talk about this terrific program. Cora, could you start us off with the background for the program? Oh. I'm very excited to talk about this project because when the sustainability program is tackling climate action, we like to take a holistic view and really focus on the economic, social, and environmental aspects of sustainability. And this project is a really great example of all three of those spheres combined. Um, it's investing in these level three chargers, which are really substantial pieces of technology. Um, Sarah might want to speak a little bit more to this, but they have a built-in battery so that the 
actual charging station doesn't need a significant upgrade to the infrastructure at the site. So we can draw low levels of power into the charging station and then pump that out at a really high rate of up to 150 kilowatt hours for a single EV or 75. So we split that in half for two EVs that can charge at once. So this is really fast charging and opens up a lot of areas for potential users for these chargers. And we're happy to locate these in more rural areas of the county so that as the EV transition happens, that there are resources for these communities to come on board with us. And studies show that rural drivers have more to benefit from switching to an EV once they make that initial transition. And this makes sense intuitively because if we think about big work trucks or just rural drivers having to go for their distances, they spend more money on gas. So switching to EVs is a really beneficial thing, especially when we pair that with home charging for them. So on the social aspect of side, we are investing in the public space of the libraries to strengthen the social cohesion of the communities. And that's something that is really an aspect that we look forward to do whenever we can in the sustainability program. And environmentally, this is great for greenhouse gas reductions because again, our rural drivers, they have to go further distances for work and for common necessities. So we're trying to provide this infrastructure as early as possible. And as the county transitions with the clean fleet purchasing policy that was adopted last year, this allows our county vehicles in these communities to stop there, fill up quickly and continue on. So we're hoping that this supports our departments make our municipal switch to electric vehicles as well. And I can pass that over to Hillary too, to add some more perspective. Yes, I was I was hoping and Sarah don't go away because I do want <laughs> we want to hear all about these but Hillary can you talk about how it really this really makes the libraries even more of a hub for services than they than they already are. And absolutely. Uh our your public libraries in the county are already there and already uh, infrastructure there, including parking and restrooms, free wireless that extends outside of the building, a nice climate controlled place to come in and wait. And we're hoping that as EV charging comes to these facilities, more people will discover their library and discover they can batch charging their vehicle with um, using the library or jump on our Wi-Fi and check your email. Uh, come in and print something, or of course, borrow books and DVDs to take home uh, to your family. This also, we really look at it, it helping us at the library invest in the county fleet. We drive all over the county in our county vehicles, our bookmobiles, our delivery vehicles. And we recently had to give up buying an electric vehicle because we did not have the infrastructure, particularly in South County, to be able to support our need. So we had to revert and buy gasoline. So in the future with these charging stations in Greenfield and San Lucas and then up uh, in Castroville, we can look at more electric vehicles from our county side because we know we'll be able to bring them to a library and charge them up there and be able to support uh, the climate action plan for the county. So we look forward to a lot of electric vehicle uh, drivers potentially discovering their library, wander on in and get a library card when you do. Thank you. So Hillary, we've got uh, what, 17 libraries? Can we put an EV station in all of them? Or are these these first three are the, are the best test? Well, these first three were selected for geography, um, not having proximity, a lot of electric vehicle stations already in the area. They're also three county owned facilities. And we do lease some of our facilities. I know that we do have some landlords interested in electric vehicle charging, and we're working with some others to say, how can we as a tenant of your facility help bring electric vehicle charging close to your libraries? So our goal would be to get electric vehicle charging close to every library, just enabling more people to get to us and pair a library errand with charging their vehicle. That would be the goal. Three is a great place to start. Thank you. Okay, Sarah, you've got the goods here to, to talk about. Uh, can you tell us about the chargers and then about how FreeWire is involved in this program and how it's all being worked out? Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say, first off, I used to work at a library, so I was more excited uh, to jump on this project and see these rolled out because I would love to charge and go into a library and hang out. Um, 
So a little bit about our chargers, and I guess for reference, I'm Sarah, I'm a policy associate at FreeWire, and I'm leading the project management for this uh, program. The chargers themselves, I I get giddy about because they are very exciting. Um, as Cora mentioned, she gave some great specifications on how the chargers actually work. The benefit of the FreeWire charger is they're easy to deploy in rural areas because they don't need to charge or they don't need to pull as much from the grid as usual uh, traditional DC fast chargers. So that makes deploying in rural areas much easier because you don't need the typical utility upgrades that would be required or the power requirements um, that are you know typical of traditional fast chargers. In addition to that, we have a pretty quick deployment time. <laughs> um, so our chargers are nice in that regard too. It doesn't take a lot of upgrades. It's easy to get in the ground. Um, and then they're up and running relatively quickly. Um, the project itself, it's very exciting. I really like these locations. A big goal that we had in mind was to reduce range anxiety, which you all have touched on a little bit. Um, you know, the more chargers you have out there, and especially fast chargers, the easier it is for people to understand that it's easy to own an EV. Um, part of my role in particular is working with folks to understand the incentives available to them. So that's going to be part of this project, too, down the line, is advertising incentives available to EV drivers. Uh, in addition to that, you know, our chargers themselves, it, for most vehicles, it takes like 30 minutes to charge, um, which is pretty phenomenal. You know, 30 minutes, you plug in, you go enjoy the library for a little while, check your email. I love that note. <laughs> um, get a library card and then you're ready to roll again. Um, and especially for fleets in rural areas, it's really important to roll out a fast charging option. So that way you can create that ease of use. Um, so that's something we're really particular about here at FreeWire. And then having the battery integrated into the charger makes things much easier on the grid um, and the drivers as well. You touched a little bit on um, community uh, engagement about EVs, but could you talk a little bit more about the people are going people in those areas are going to get a lot of information before the EV chargers arrive, and they're also going to get connected through a survey and some other things. So, if you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, uh, as a policy person, a firm believer in making the community aware of anything you're doing. <laughs> um, so when it comes time for the chargers to get on site, we are going to roll out a few surveys, just checking with individuals around the county, making sure everyone's aware of the project, what they're familiar with when it comes to EVs um, and you know their chargers, as well as a few other details, just making sure everyone's engaged and involved and feels like their feedback is heard, um, especially for any future sites you might use. Um, and then in addition to that, we'll also do some ribbon cutting events. So keep an eye out for those down the line. Those are always fun. Um, other than that, we also have a few digital campaigns we'll be doing. So we'll do some press releases, some engagement in local communities, um, newsletters, things of that nature. So that way, everyone who is in the county, <laughs> we can reach as many folks as possible. I want to make sure everyone is aware and understands how it would impact them and what they can, how they can interact with the charger. So, uh, Sarah, I don't know if this is a question for you or for Cora. Um, this is a pretty significant investment in terms of money for us to put these chargers there and grants were needed. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the grants that came in and the fact that the county's going to own these. We opted to own them versus lease them. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it a little bit. I'm sure Cora will have some good perspective too. Um, but we received this grant uh, ourselves, FreeWire, Monterey County, uh, with the CEC or the California Energy Commission. They had a grant program specifically designed for rural communities. Um, so, you know, this is where the our, our two organizations were an excellent fit. We provided a charger that was easy to install in rural communities and Monter Monterey County had excellent site locations. Um, so that was what made us a strong contender for that uh, for that grant. And then with this grant, it allows us to not only um, uh, you know, work out the details, the project management, owning the chargers and installing the chargers uh, and then preparing community outreach. Uh, it kind of helps fund all of that. I don't know, Cora, I'm sure you have some thoughts too. Yeah, it is a pretty substantial project. Um... So the initial grants package was for around $749,000. And of this, the county was covering um, 
about 540. And there is the match that is the rest of the percentage. So 540-ish thousand will be reimbursed from the California Energy Commission. And then the rest is the county contributing this to the community. The public works budget for some infrastructure and parking lot upgrades that has happened or that is going to be happening for part of this project is about $380,000. And we are returning to the budget committee to ask for another um, 100 and so. Mm -hmm. So the overall investment for this project comes over just over a million dollars that the county is allocating to invest in these communities. And a significant portion of that will be reimbursed from the state. And that really, I think, I don't know about you, but f having 50% of it roughly reimbursable really helps make it happen. It, it's, you know, right now, times are tight everywhere. Absolutely. Any other thing that people should know about these EV chargers? And any question, if, if people have questions for anyone, go ahead and put them in chat or raise your hand. I mean, I can share a little bit on the user side. Um, I just want to note that the chargers themselves, we've designed them to almost look like gas pumps. That way it's very familiar to users. Um, it's also comes in a couple of different language, comes in Spanish, um, and I think also Japanese. But in addition to that, we also have several different types of card readers and payment types. So it really makes it easy to use um, on, on the user side. Fantastic. Too much more to add, Maya, just that we are hoping to get these out by the end of summer 2024, and we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I don't see any other additional questions for you. Thank you all for being here today. This is a really exciting project. And boy, Sarah, when you said range anxiety, you you, you hit it for me because I have range anxiety. So we're <laughs> I think this is a great project, and hopefully we can get more of these in the future. Absolutely. We'll be there for you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so now we're going to do a little bit of celebrating with Monterey Salinas Transit. From September 1973, with six very well-worn buses on four routes to today, with 163 heavy-duty uh, buses, minibuses, and trolleys on 36 routes. Boy, has MST come a long way, and they're celebrating their 50th anniversary, and we invited Carl Sidorik, the, um, the general manager, uh, to talk a little bit about the milestones along the way and what's ahead for MST. Hi, Carl. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Maya, and thank you, everyone who's attending. I'm here in the MST time machine standing in front of uh, what is now Natalie's garage along Galmani, what was the original MST uh, facility in front of our original uh, then Monterey Peninsula transit bus in 1973. Uh, you love the burgundy and gold. Um, probably folks had leisure suits of the same color back scheme back then. Um, you know, that first year uh, they carried a half a million uh, passenger trips in 1972-73, uh, uh, we've carried as many as 5 million passengers in a single year in recent years uh, prior to COVID. Um, and uh, we've experimented, we've been at the forefront of lots of alternative uh, uh, drive, lots of alternative technologies to drive our buses. We were talking about electric, but MST uh, you know, was early on with lead acid battery technology, compressed natural gas technology. Uh, we for a period of time, grew our own mustard seed in South Monterey County, and we're uh, processing it and blending it. So we had our own uh, biodiesel uh, that was 100% grown and processed in the county for a small period of time. Uh, to now, uh, we were at the forefront of inductively charged vehicles, where our vehicles uh, are able to charge through the air from a plate that's in the ground that's hooked up to the grid. Um, and now we're moving, you know, looking to the future for hydrogen fuel cell technologies because of things like range anxiety. Uh, when a when a passenger vehicle of a few thousand pounds, uh, you can only get 160 miles. Uh, you know, a, a, a transit bus is about 19 tons, and we go 350 miles plus a day. So we're looking at other technologies other than battery electric, like hydrogen, uh, for the future. And we're looking for grants and, and, and planning for hydrogen fueling stations uh, along the Highway 101 corridor and also along in the Monterey Peninsula. Um, 
primarily we're focused on developing the MST surf busway and BRT. Uh, just within the past year, we were able to secure um, a little over uh, $50 million um, from state and federal sources, which provided us full funding for that project. And uh, we're at 95% of the design for the construction. And really we're just at now the permit phase of getting permits from the cities of Marina, Sand City and the Coastal Commission uh, for, for uh, permitting the construction of that project. And then we'll be uh, on to construction and hopefully within the next two years, uh, cutting a ribbon on that. And that project will allow buses to, will, be, will really be the first high occupancy vehicle lanes in Monterey County. And they will be you know, strictly for MST zero emission uh, vehicles. We'll, we'll, all that will operate on that, in that lane that we'll be constructing along uh, the six and a half miles between Marina and Sand City. Um, to the future, we're also looking to build a new uh, facility in the Salinas area that will have the ability to do the hydrogen fueling and battery electric charging that we're going to require in the future. But that's still probably another five years out. So um, over the past 50 years, you know, we've carried over 178 million uh, passenger boardings on our buses. And we're looking forward to a, a, a great uh, uh, comeback as we, uh, as the, our local economy recovers from the past few years, our ridership is rebounding and is healthy uh, from all state and federal uh, standards. And we look forward to another great 50 years. And uh, we did a great video, uh, it's on our social media sites. I just shared it with everyone uh, where, you know, it was my concept that oftentimes people who ride the bus are stigmatized in a certain degree. I mean, many of them are. I mean, the vast majority of our, our uh, riders are uh, very low income people of color people historically underrepresented in our society. And as a result, that comes with some stigma associated with that, unfortunately. But we have a video of many of our community leaders from mayors, city council members, uh, state officials, the head of the California State Trans uh, Department of Transportation, Caltrans, and even our own Congressman Jimmy Panetta, Panetta, all at some point in their lives were dependent on MST services to get to school, to get to their first jobs, to get to college, to do what they needed to do in their life. So uh, you can see some videos. I just shared that uh, with everyone and, and hear from uh, very successful people, community leaders who at some point in their life uh, were dependent on transit. And, um, and they may not be now, but you know, public transit is a way for people to get started in their work career and their school careers and lead them on to bigger and better things. So be happy to take any questions. Thank you. And I recall during the pandemic, I had you on one of our news briefings talking about how the bus stayed, buses stayed safe for people to ride during the pandemic. Right. I mean, when you talk about, you're talking about innovating just in terms of transit and mileage, but during the pandemic, you had to innovate for safety. For safety and for service. Uh, you know, we did not want to um, lay off our drivers and then be in the hiring um, uh fix that many uh, companies are in now trying to rehire people in this economy. So we kept drivers working uh, instead of, you know, driving the typical routes, we were delivering meals for Meals on Wheels. We took our Wi-Fi enabled buses and took them into rural communities to provide Wi-Fi hotspots for students so that they could get their assignments that, you know, were no longer uh, uh, in the schools. Um, and then, yes, we did a lot of, uh, air filtration uh, improvements and on, on bus hand sanitizer locations. We were out in the forefront of most of that, frankly, and we were recognized both at a national and state level for how quickly we were able to um, pivot and, and uh, respond to uh, respond COVID. Um, and then through the recovery, taking our buses uh, uh, and donating them to nonprofits so they could turn them into COVID test, mobile COVID testing, mobile vaccine units. Uh, we did a number of that. And just FYI, MST does have another dozen or so vehicles that it will be uh, 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 making available to local nonprofits to use uh, for their own purposes. And uh, if there is any interest in that, please reach out to MST uh, at our on, on our social media or on our website and. Uh, let us know and we can make certain that uh, one of our, our well-worn vehicles uh, is set aside for donation purposes for local nonprofits. 
So in how you were saying you're going to donate them to nonprofits, how could a nonprofit, what are some fun, what are some ways a nonprofit could use one of these vehicles oh. beyond the testing sites, which were totally was fabulous? Yeah. So uh, we've, uh, I helped Monterey is a group that provides meals to uh, 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 homeless persons. Uh, they've they've uh, received our, our vehicles um, and they use those vehicles to carry uh, meals around the community to uh, homeless folks. Uh, we've had a number of uh, nonprofits, whether it's uh, folks that are working with uh, uh, people with mental health challenges uh, or other disabilities will use our buses to, um, you know, they're still operable uh, for the most part. They may need a little, uh, they may need a little care, um, but they use them to, to help their students. We've had uh, local color guards, uh, they're, they're military uh, veterans who attend funerals and also other um, various uh, functions to, to do their uh, military displays. They've used our buses to carry, uh, uh, their color guards around the county. There's any number. We had Gill's Basketball Academy in uh, in East Salinas uh, took one of our buses. We we basically charge you a dollar, charge the nonprofit a dollar to transfer the title, and then they do with it what they will, and they use it for their nonprofit that helps teach basketball to underprivileged uh, folks. Rancho Cielo, another great nonprofit, has used our buses to transport their students. So. Uh, there's great, there are many uh, unserved mobility needs of specific individuals that public transit just can't serve with the limited resources we have. So uh, we make our vehicles available to those nonprofits who can supply a driver and supply, supply the TLC needed to get those vehicles back in well operating condition. Uh, we'll help them out that way. Fantastic. This is such great news. And it, we were hoping for another 50 years. And who knows, 50 years from now, you'll be talking about your flying bus from Joby, right? I don't think it'll be me talking about it, but maybe somebody <laughs> from MST. Thank you, Carl, very You're much. Welcome. Really, and a happy anniversary to Thank you so <laughs> much. Bye-bye. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the briefing this week. Our next briefing is next week. We'll see you then.